Good morning from the First Baptist Church of Bullhead City, Arizona. How are you doing today? Out. Okay, that's good. It is Resurrection Day. It is April the 17th, 2022. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I love it. You guys had your coffee today. Well, I'll tell you what. We don't have any birthdays or anniversaries, but uh, if you would stand with me, we'll open with a word of prayer and start doing some singing. This is a great day, great day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son. We thank you for what you have done for us, for what he has done for us, what the Holy Spirit does for us every day in this world. We just give you the, the honor and the glory and the praise because you have such an amazing plan. I mean, how can we possibly thank you enough for giving us eternity with you? It's just impossible. We pity those folks who don't know you and we're trying to reach out to them, Lord. Just help us do that. We know that there are people, uh, uh, Christian folks around the world suffering. We know they suffer in Africa and we know they suffer in the Ukraine, for example. The, the pagan army is, uh, is bombing Ukraine and, and Christians and, and non-Christians alike are all suffering there. So, Father, we just pray that your spirit would occupy this world, that would come and, and that uh, the people who are invading other nations and the people who don't know you would come to you, would realize who you are, what you are, and why you were here. Father, we just want to be a part of that. We want to be good servants. So, Father, we once again thank you for doing everything that you do for us, for providing for us, and we ask that you'd bless this congregation and the people who are hearing my voice. And, Father, you are worthy of our praise, so we give you the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, sing along with me here. some of these or all of these whatever so you know we'll let you uh, pick and choose what you want are there going to be any leftovers all the, lilies are going to be up for grabs. all the lilies will be up for grabs so you know don't knock anybody over coming to get them <laughs> but, uh, but uh, help yourself when it's all over with the hydrangeas are going home with Marlene I think and I don't blame her those are beautiful anyway it was a beautiful service and we thank the Carell family for providing all the flowers and you said uh, your co-workers uh, sent the, the spray this yeah. you know, yeah, spray. Glad to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. But anyway, uh, it's, it's beautiful and it smells great. So anyway, good timing. Easter's here. 
anyway, uh, thanks again for that. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're having our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. I forgot to announce it last week, but you'll see an envelope like that in front of you in the, in the little tray uh, on the pew, in the back of the pew. So we're gonna do that this week and we'll extend that through next week. This is for North America Missions. Uh, it helps plant churches. It helps refurbish churches who uh, have like the, the roof blow off or something and they need an in, influx of funds real quick. And the Southern Baptists, you know, have this to, to, to help North American churches. This is not an international mission. This is North American missions, essentially. So we're going to run that this week and next week. Uh, the offering plates are back here at the back door with Wayne. And there's one straight down below me here, too, if you need some place to drop an envelope. Anyway, uh, of course, we have our usual Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday stuff. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Actually, guys, it's 11 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning. Uh, we meet over in the fellowship hall for a Bible study, and we have a good time. On Tuesday at 5.30 uh, in the fellowship hall, Renee runs a Bible study class. And I think we're going to change the tables around, Sue, so that they're kind of circular, so that y'all can see each other's smiling faces. And uh, then on Wednesday, we have our prayer meeting. And uh, now this coming Wednesday, we're going to have a business meeting. We just... Uh, we don't have any bad news or anything, but we're going to have the business meeting. Our constitution requires quarterly, so we're going to just do that uh, Wednesday, six o'clock, and uh, you know, come if you like. Uh, it's an open meeting for anyone who's here, and, and uh, so that uh, that takes about as much time as your average prayer meeting, forty-five minutes or an hour. Yes, Renee. Do you have to be a member to go to that meeting? No, no, no. It's an open meeting. You don't have to be a member. Uh, members of the church can vote if there's oh, something okay. to be voted on. Like, should we put a, another parking lot between here and Kingman or something like that? And, you know, then we vote on that and the members vote. Uh, but um, let's see. Uh, Thursday mornings, of course, the ladies meet for their Bible study. 9 o'clock, excuse me, 9.30 Thursday morning, and the girls have a good time. They claim they run from 9.30 to 10.30. It's probably closer to 11.30. <laughs> Those of us who uh, are here helping them out. 12 o'clock, yeah. <laughs> And it's not that they get carried away, you know, socializing or anything. It's actually called fellowship when the ladies are doing it. I'm just watching this clean toilets, what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm mowing the lawn. Yeah, if you're toilets. male and you show up, you will be mowing lawn and cleaning toilets. Just understand. Uh huh. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, it gives me something to do. I don't need to join a gym because I've got plenty to do right here. Anyway, uh, it's all good. But uh, from Monday through Thursday, we have uh, things going on here. So uh, please uh, join up and, and go do that. Now, I don't think I have any other announcements at the moment, but instead of mission pictures this morning, the pastor wants to talk about our Philippine mission. So, Pastor Roy. Uh, I've been asked very frequently lately uh, by several members of you who know who we are in the church about does Southern Baptist support our missions? No. Uh, the Annie Armstrong is for, like Bob said, North American missions. Lottie Moon is for Asian missions, but uh, they don't support us in any way. If you want something you give to go to the mission that goes to the Philippines, there's no overhead cost. Everything goes directly there. Everything you give out there goes directly there. If you want to do something that way, you have to take one of the envelopes in front of you, write Asian missions on it, designate whatever you send, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. But if you give it to Lottie Moon or you give it to Annie Armstrong, I'm not saying anything against those programs, and you think it's going to the missions where we support the Philippines, it is not, okay? I've asked that question a lot lately, and I want people to know that. Uh, on that note, also, whenever we just got donated, I, told, uh, I think I told, no, I told Doris this morning, I told Sherry, uh, we got donated a whole pickup truck load full of clothes that's coming in either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So, all right. Uh, all right. Yeah. And new clothes, baby clothes, and Christmas clothes and stuff. So, uh, before I run out on you guys, we're going to run off. I'll be down here to unload that stuff. But then, of course, Doris and Miss Sherry take care of it. Where's Sherry hiding this morning? There she is. Doris and Miss Sherry will take care of it. But the and mission Bob boards, and Jim, too. Mission boards do not in any way support our independent uh, church missions. Okay? If anybody has any other questions, just send me out. Thank yep. you, Bob. It's true. We have our very own mission uh, outreach effort, and it has nothing to do with the larger Southern Baptist Church. Uh, Roy came to us from the Philippines. He knows pastors over there. He knows and he's helped establish churches over there. So we know who needs what and where they need it. And a lot of this goes to Mindanao, which is a primarily a Muslim area. 
And uh, so we uh, want to make sure that the key thing is we have direct accountability. We see yeah. the stuff, we see where it goes, and, and you know, we don't have 19 executives trying to check on something. I know when I contact them and they talk to me, I talk with them live on the phone, which I did with Bob when I was in the Philippines, 40,000 feet in the air. And Bob's like, wait a minute, you're in an airplane, yeah. And you're looking at me, yeah. Bob's sitting in his chair, you know, his t-shirt on, whatever. He just freaks out about it. But we have direct accountability, so we know where stuff goes. Yeah, I had no idea what this thing called messenger is. Yeah. You know, I'm on my phone, he's in the air, six miles up, somewhere <laughs> over the Pacific or something. How is this happening? <laughs> anyway, I'm not a tech guy, you know. This is about as fancy as I get. I plug it in and plays. Anyway, uh, let's move on with our uh, music service here. Uh, we got some more songs to do. And uh, this being Resurrection Day, we are all redeemed. Let's proclaim it. How about that? Redeemed how I want to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite
sir. Well, there's another one that's uh, been around a while. Uh, at the cross, we have to remember the cross today. It's the symbol that most Christians wear, and it was a very, very important thing too. So. Jesus, of course, as the healer. Surely he bore our sorrows, the 
got a message for us, and we're going to get out of his way and let him read it. <coughs> Morning, everybody. Guess what we're going to do now? 77 doesn't get it. 66 sounds better, huh? Read 60. Read 66. That's not like a plan. Okay. See, Bob used to sit up front, but no tag runs to the back now. Are you saying there's hot air? No. Good to see everybody today, Resurrection Day. Yeah. People texted me this morning, and all of them except one said Resurrection Day, because they used to be now. They'll text me and say, Happy Easter, and I'll say, Happy Resurrection Day. And only one missed it. And about two seconds later, before I could answer, I said, Oops, Resurrection Day to you. It's Resurrection Day. What a wonderful day it is. The victory over death was won came back. Much different than, than some of the other guys were we're going to talk about this morning. First of all, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, humbly and thankfully we come before you. Father, you bless us in so many ways. Every time we turn around, there's something new that you've done for us, and we don't recognize it, and we don't say thank you. When we wake up in the morning, we may complain that our joints are stiff. We may complain that it's raining outside, out here in Bullhead. And we may complain about this or that, but Father, ultimately, we woke up, and we woke up due to your grace and your love. So, Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for letting us live in a country where we can, we can freely, freely worship you. And we thank you for the fact that when we come here today in corporate fellowship with each other, we are in fellowship with you, for two or more gathered in your name. Father, we give you all the honor, all the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Resurrection Day. Jesus builds a bridge. Most of you know I'm taking some time off beginning tomorrow, and as I've been preparing this sermon, God's directed me to so many different scriptures. 3.37 a.m. the other morning, I read a piece about Easter and the importance of Resurrection Day versus Easter. Easter being what the mass media and commercial organizations use. And I began to reflect on it, how so many things frequently not mentioned in the media or even mainstream ministry. As this began to occupy my mind more and more, I remember a few years ago, I had a conversation with an individual who told me, quote, religion is the opioid of the masses, promising everything to everyone, professing to be different according to doctrine, yet still a fairy tale. He then asked me what makes Christianity or being a believer any different than any other religion. Now that question, I may not answer all you guys' questions, that one I can answer quickly. Thank you, Lord. There's a cross on the front of this pulpit you only see once a year. Not the normal iron one, if anyone noticed. It only goes up there one time a year. It has a lily and three words. He is risen. There are over 4,600 recognized religions in the world right now. Only one has a true living God. Only one came back. Jesus died, as did all the other main individuals in those beliefs, but he rose again. Now, if you want to put this in simple media jargon of today, Muhammad died and missed the caravan back. I wonder if it was a Dodge caravan. No. Confucius died, and apparently the same pan sunk, because he didn't make it either. And old Buddha, well, he just broke the rickshaw. He never got back either. My Lord and Savior came back. These other guys didn't make it. Uh, when I was in the Philippines, uh, there was a, a Muslim individual, and he converted to Christianity, and everybody was asking him, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? And he would look at you very seriously, and he'd say, if you were on a journey, and you came to a fork in the road, and standing on the left was a dead man, and standing on the right was a person who was alive, which one would you take lessons from and instructions and directions? <laughs> and I couldn't stop laughing. He said, he said, yeah, I said, you know, listen to Muhammad. Muhammad's dead. Uh -huh. Listen to Buddha. Buddha's dead. 
But my standing living Jesus Christ can give me direction, amen? amen? He can give me direction. He can tell me which direction I need to go in. And believe me, I frequently need that. You know? I'm telling you, Tom Tom is one thing, Jesus Christ is another, amen? amen? He leads you where you need to go, and he does that because he returned. Now, only Jesus Christ returned was seen by 514 men and numerous women walking the face of the earth after having been dead. That return was a means for our salvation. That victory over death changed everything. I am always amazed how God reinforces what he wants me to say on Sunday when I set foot on this holy ground. This week, Linda H., I'll just say her last name as an emotional. Linda H. sent me a text with a key to Lee Strobel's story. How many are familiar with Lee Strobel's story? Okay. She sent me with a text to that, and I reviewed it for about the 1,000th time. I've seen it many times and, and read it. Lee tried to disprove God by solidifying his own faith. But it's odd how we live in a world that wants proof and wants evidence, yet every day I see criminals set free because of an exclusionary rule. It seems like we throw out the evidence we don't want to see. We do. And we do it in our faith, people. We do. Instead of saying, this is absolute proof. And folks, make no mistake about it. That's absolute proof, okay? Nothing but truth in there. No book that a man ever wrote is as true as evidence. Because it's God's word. But we find evidence, direct evidence on someone, where you can't use that. I have a video of him shooting 19 people. Well, we can't use that. Why not? You can't justify me not using that. Well, the way it was found, I don't care how it was found. This is this person committing a crime. Problem is that we, we're so used to this world letting people off on technicalities, which is better expressed by saying the attorney with the most, most money. How much justice do you want? How much money do you have? Problem is when you leave this world, it's not in the hands of men. It's in the hands of he who is righteous and will call you on everything you've done. Well, Lord, you can't use that the exclusionary rule. And he'll just look down and say, I include everyone. I don't know about exclusion. Oh, except now, you're about to be excluded. Elevator down, and you get dropped. That's a hard truth for some people. You'll see churches that won't preach it. You'll see pastors that won't get up there and say, they won't say hell, they won't say sin. They won't say, this is going to happen. They'll say, it's all good and rosy. Everything is fine. I think they're Tiny Tim playing with ukulele with a tulip spot. I swear I do. You know? They're up there, everything is fine. Let's be happy. Yeah? What did you mainline or snort or smoke this morning? Look at this world. Bob mentioned the situation in the Ukraine, but it's all around the world. You know, Burma. Otherwise known as marijuana. I was there before I came here. Children being enslaved, being sold to American and Chinese and European businessmen to do with as they please. A 60 year civil war. We think this world is okay? It's all good? No. If you can't tell the truth, don't tell it at all. Period. God wants us to tell the truth. And the truth isn't pretty. Look outside your door. I get my hair cut the other day, and a lady said, she said, I came up to a five-way intersection. Someone said, I knew it was going to be a driving. You're right. <laughs> she came up to a five-way intersection, and the car on her way, she allowed to go. Well, the young girl behind her blowed the horn. You know, and was cussing and scranting and screaming, ranting and raving. Came up alongside her and told her she was number one, but she didn't use the index finger, you know, <laughs> and told her she should, quote, unquote, go back to Mexico. The lady who cuts my hair is, is, is from Mexico. And she said, you know what I did? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what you did? She said, I turned the stereo up and went, have a nice day. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> so she pulled out her phone and started sliding on brakes or whatever then. She said, my husband said, one more time, I'm going to reach up my left foot and stomp the accelerator. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. You know? But I love her attitude. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. And that just infuriates the world. There's so much anger and hatred in the world. What do we do about anger and hatred, though? Folks, we need to follow Jesus. Jesus builds a bridge. We're going to talk about how he built the bridge and what the bridge was for. Because we needed a bridge back to God. We have lost him. 
and we've done it again. As a generation, as a world, as a society, we've done it again. Don't want to hear anything about God, nothing about God. What on earth would you not want to hear good news, Miss Sue? I always want to hear good news. Always want to hear it. But we don't want to hear it because we've been conditioned by the world not to. We talked about evidence and the ridiculous court rulings I see and judges that throw stuff out. In law enforcement, we are forever indebted to a man named Dr. Edward Lopert. He was called the Sherlock Holmes of Leon, France. He developed the low-cost exchange theory, which simply states, every contact leaves a trace. Everything, every person you come in contact with, you leave something there and they leave something on you. Every situation you walk into, every room you walk into, be it a follicle, school, skin, it's what DNA is based upon. But it's more than that. Let's look at what Jesus Christ left behind. He impacted, this is one single man that impacted the entire world in the form of a human being. Who else can say that? No general, you know? No big Buddha who broke the rickshaw. I mean, yeah, come on, guys. He is still impacting the world every single day. And he did it by building a bridge. He did it by building a bridge. Look at scripture. John 10, 17 says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And 18 says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my accord. Let's stop right there. No one took it. Nail didn't hold Jesus on a cross. Love did. Okay? He did it because he wanted to. And nobody took his life. He gave it. That's a big difference. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. Jesus is speaking here of the difference between a hired hand and a good shepherd who owns the sheep in John 10. He says, the shepherd who is hired is just there to do a job. But the owner of the sheep is there to protect them. He has a vested interest. Jesus owns you. He does. But he doesn't own you in slavery. He owns you in freedom. If you want to get away from the slavery of going across to, to, the, to the casinos and wonder where your rent money went, you know, going across to the casinos and wondering where this went or that went or something else went, then you need to find God. Jesus can straighten it up for you real quick. I was talking to someone the other day, whatever, and they said, you know, I said, I just, he looked at me and said, I just realized that those casinos couldn't pay the electric bill if they were there to give away money. I said, amen. I said, you just realized that. He said, yeah. I said, how much did you lose before you realized that? <laughs> he just smiled. Okay? They couldn't have those businesses across that river if they didn't make money, folks. And they make money out of everyone who walks in that door. You know? I love Bob's response to that. Guy asked Bob one time when I was around, said, said uh, do you play the lottery? Bob said, no, I don't play the lottery. He said, well, you can't win if you don't play the lottery. Bob says, I can't lose either. <laughs> I like that. You know? Anytime you put that up and you think you've got a chance, why do, why bet on something that's not a sure thing? God's a sure thing. He sent his son to die on the cross, and he said, my son will be resurrected. And he was. <laughs> he walked away from that thing. Wow. And yet, we'll, we'll put our faith in the promises of man. Wrong place to put it, guys. Absolute wrong place to put it. Jesus was the good shepherd, and he says, I lay it down and I reclaim it. It wasn't taken. I gave it. The key point, I have authority to take it back. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, it says, Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory over death. To the dear Mary Magdalene, Jesus asked in John 20, 15, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Wow. 
Then she realizes that this is Jesus, and she turns and calls him teacher. As he is seen by more and more people, there are, of course, detractors. How many know that person who, if they look at something and see it, will not believe it? If they've got an opinion on something, no matter what your opinion is, no matter what the facts are, they won't believe it. You know? I can walk up to them, take a hammer, whack them on the toe or whatever, and they say, no, he didn't do it. Why? That person over there did it because they have something against that person. They deny facts to fit their own situation. It's the person who's always saying, you know, life never treated me fairly. What did you do? What do you mean? God's never treated me fairly. Okay. God's never done anything for me. I love it when those people come up to me because I said, what have you done for God lately? And they just look at you. Well, I have to do something for him. You have to love him. You have to serve him. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship, folks. Yeah. You're giving your heart, and he's giving you everything. But if that's not a fair trade, according to you, you need this reevaluation in your life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. He laid it down because he loved you. Of course, you get these detractors. People, like I said, they look at obvious fact. I mean, I've seen people just look at a car or whatever and say, that car is blue. And the car didn't have a blue tint to it whatsoever. I used to paint cars. I painted cars when I was a kid, about 12 years old, started painting them, painting lines on them, stuff like that. And the, kid was, and the guy was saying, that car is blue. And I'm like, how colorblind are you? <laughs> I'm not colorblind, that's blue. They don't want to admit obvious fact. The problem is, is that fact is fact and it's not going to change. Jesus ran into that with Doubting Thomas. Remember Doubting Thomas? John 20 through 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, get this, guys. Doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, first of all, guys, when a man comes through a locked door, I believe him right there. He had to take me no further. You don't have to take me any further. You just walk through that door. Let me see if your hand has a scar. Can everybody in the church say, duh? I mean, come on. This, this, this guy, he needed the dunce cap. Yeah. But people are like that. We run into him every day. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And then he said, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's not what you see, folks. Because I'm telling you, you see a lot of stuff nowadays that and it's unbelievable. You know, I saw a car try to fly the other day. It didn't make it. Uh -huh. Coming back from Las Vegas. And it was a police car. And he was he was in pursuit of a phantom vehicle because eyewitnesses coming from the other direction said they didn't see anything for miles. So <laughs> explain that one, guys. Cars can't fly. I don't care what you see on TV. What bothers me is now there has to be a commercial to tell you that. Yeah. Has to be a commercial disclaimer saying cars can't fly. If you think a vehicle can fly, do me a favor. Stay off the road when I am on there, please. <laughs> you know, I hope some of these people see this part because obviously they aren't listening. People will doubt simply because a lot of times they don't want to believe. It's too good to be true. How many of you have heard that? Too good to be true. That's all good. You look at it, we look at someone like the guy who told me Christianity was the opioid of the masses. His perspective was, it doesn't get any better than this life. If it doesn't get any better than this life, we'd all be in trouble. Amen. This life is a preparation, a staging area. It's where we get ready we become more mature. And remember, this is something people people forget. I see it all the time. And tell them, as you rise in maturity and grace spiritually, you have to extend further. 
And people don't do it. They say, I'm telling you, I don't know why I got to let me reach the next level. It's like, I got to get a promotion. I don't know why I can't get promoted. I do everything that's in my job description. You do only and exactly everything in your job description. That's the problem. Stay over. Extra credit. How many people remember extra credit in school? How many people did it? Made you come ahead, didn't it? Huh? Some of us it saved, Bob. I'm not mentioning any names. But. Do extra credit for God. What can you ever do? What can you ever do? Everyone takes me up. What can you ever do that will compare with hanging on that cross? Nothing. Nothing you can do will ever compare with that. But beyond that, nothing will ever compare with coming back. Coming back because you said you would. I am so amazed at the most world nowadays when I hear I'll be back. I'll be back. Don't put anything up for sale in Bullhead City. You'll get 931 phone calls saying I'll be there tomorrow. Apparently tomorrow never comes here, Bob. You know? You'll have 17,461 people who have the cash in their pocket. But when they show up, they've left it at home. <laughs> I, I tell, I've never seen anything. I've been all over the world. I've never seen a place like this about that. Everybody, you know, or someone will come and then look at your $15,000 motorhome and say, I'll give you $700 for it. <laughs> what do you write that in the other say? It's like, do you understand you can't buy the tires for that? Or you just don't want to deal? <laughs> no, I don't want to deal with you. People doubt. People doubt. They see something good and they doubt it. Or they want to detract from it. Have you noticed that too today? If someone that shows up and does a good job, and it's commendable. Instead of saying, good job, I'm going to say, but in 1962, he stopped my grandmother's toe. You know? There's got to be a way to detract from it. I've said it a million times, and I'll say it one more time. If you have a lit candle, well, you do me a favor, turn the lights out back there. Okay. If you have a lit candle, and Miss Sue is holding it, and then Paul lights a candle. The room is lit more, correct? But if Paul blows out Miss Sue's candle, other than the fact of getting knocked out, but, but, if Paul, <laughs> but if Paul blows out Miss Sue's candle, he hasn't made his candle brighter. He's made the whole room darker. Thank you, Wayne. People don't understand that. They want to, I'll, I'll just, I'll detract from you. I'll take away from you. Ha, I'll show you. And blow out the candle. Imagine doing that in a dark tunnel. Yep. Now you can't see either. What have you done? But I made myself look brighter. No, you made yourself look dimmer. <laughs> Seriously. We see it over and over and over. People want to detract from everything good. All you gotta do is look at some, you look at someone in a store sometimes and say, have a nice day, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, obviously not what's wrong with you. <laughs> I've got it in my heart, I'm happy. Jesus offered Thomas the physical proof he saw it, but told him to have faith. And this is where Jesus builds the bridge. The loss of faith in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 3, 6 through 7, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed thick leaves together and made coverage for themselves. That's where the chasm begins. That's where there's a gap between God and mankind. And we see in Genesis 3:16 through 19, to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. How many ladies in here have had a child? Can you raise your hands, please? Remember all that pain? Blame Eve, okay? Don't blame your husband, blame Eve. That's where it came from, right there. I will make your childbearing very severe, but with labor pains you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. 
since from it you were taken. To dust you are and to dust you will return. This gap had to be repaired. There was a great chasm. A great void created by that singular act. And it had to be fixed. It wasn't just a pothole, guys. We're talking about a cavernous hole. And it had to be repaired. It had to be fixed. That situation had to be fixed. And Jesus did that, not just in his death. I was only part of it. With his death, he paid for the sins. With his resurrection, he proved death could be beaten. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's beaten. It's no longer the end. I was talking to a guy one time, whatever he said, I said, what do you think happens when you die? The worms eat you. I said, the worms eat the body. What happens to your soul? I don't know. I love it when they say those words. I don't know. Do you want to be sure? If you want to be sure, all you need to do is go to God. He's sure. He's positive. And I asked him, I said, he said, well, what if that doesn't work? I said, what do you got to lose? Well, what do you mean? I said, if you believe in God, follow his commands all the days of your life, and you get to the end and there's no God there, what have you lost? You're still getting eaten by worms. That's something he understood. <laughs> You got nothing to lose going to God. You got everything to lose if you don't. That's right. Amen? Yeah. Every single thing in your life will mean nothing. <laughs> in the book of Isaiah, 53, 4 through 6. Remember that song we just sung? Listen to this scripture. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Or, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Wow. You sound familiar? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He paid the price, and yet here we are still doing the same dumb stuff today, Bob. But the price is paid. All you have to do is go back to God. Confess of your mouth that you are a sinner. Believe in your heart that he died on that cross for you and was resurrected. It's not just the dying, it's the resurrection. He came back for you and me and every one of us. And I don't know why he won't come back for me. I somehow, you know, shh, don't tell Cammy, okay? <laughs> I'm serious, you know? He came back for us. I know personally, I'm not worth coming back to. I'll tell you that right now. But he loves me that much. And he loves you that much. Come back from the dead. You hear people say extreme stuff when they're in love. They'll say, you know, I'd walk through walls of fire for you. I love you, honey, but <laughs> I'd walk through walls of fire for you. I'd do this for you. I'd do that for you. You know? And they don't understand that, 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 that the husband has arachnophobia and a tiny spider appears in the floor and he's up on the counter. Honey! <laughs> <laughs> we will say so many things we don't follow through with. His actions not only heal our physical, emotional, and mental needs, it repaired our spiritual relationship with God. That's the key. That's the bridge. In the book of Luke 16:26, besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. The bridge has been repaired, guys, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Folks, once you've gone to heaven or hell, you're done. Can't be repaired. You're done. If you're there in hell, whatever saying, water, water, you're not going to get water. But if you're in heaven and you're looking down at someone and they're in hell, neither can you help them. If you want to help them, if you want to build that bridge, if you want to stir your friend, your family member, do it. There you go. Say it louder, Paul. Do it now. One more time. Do it now. Right now. Do it right now. I love it when people help me do this. Get it booze, guys. Do it right now. Do something. You can do it. You can 
helped build the bridge. Jesus, in the action of being crucified and returning to life to give both a bridge, led us back to God. It reminds me of two stories I've heard over the years. In the first story, two young boys were playing near the beachfront on a huge sand dune. And after a little while, the pocket in the sand dune gave way. The little boys fell into the sand. Later on, the father came looking for them. Finally, he spotted the young boy with his head above the sand, but his body almost buried. The father was angry. He ran up, quick to make a judgment. Why did your older brother leave you like this? The child replied, he didn't, Father. He made me stand on his shoulders as I'm doing even now. Yeah. That was the bridge to his younger brother's life. He created it. He created that bridge. He took that sacrifice upon himself. The other story, two brothers were left a family farm upon the death of their father. They split the farm evenly, built homes on the either sides of the river, which ran through the property. The older brother was in town one day, and his high school chum, who was a businessman, gave him some advice. He said, you could be a wealthy man if you would just grow more crops and raise more livestock. The older brother went home and promptly diverted three quarters of the water to his side of the property. After a while, the younger brother was barely keeping his head above water. He was in town one day and he was looking around and he said, I got time, I got, I got to do something. His wife was on, his kids were starving. And he said, that's right, they've been starving. See, positive reinforcement. And he said, I got to do something. He found a gentleman with, a, with an old pickup truck. He walked over, he said, you do, uh, he said, I can do anything. He said, wow. He said, can you build the dam? And I said, yeah, I can build the dam. So he took, takes this guy home and he shows him what he wants. He said, I want a dam. He said, I only want 50% of the water. Well, I want half of it. He's diverted the water. I want 50% of the water. I want you to build me a dam. I said, okay. He said, but I don't want to be around when my brothers, when I'm doing this, because so I'm going to leave town. So he set the man to work building a dam and he left town. Months later, he returns. But there's not a dam there. There's a bridge from one side of the property over to the other. And he says, what's wrong with you? I told you to build a dam. And he says, yeah, no. He says, I think someone wants to talk to you. And the younger brother walks to the beginning of the bridge, and he sees his older brother on the other side. And he's crying, and he's pulling his hair, and he's running towards his younger brother. They meet in the middle of them, they hug, and the water's no longer diverted. He goes back and looks at the repairman and says, that was wonderful. He said, we have so many jobs around here. We have so much that could be done. He said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll hire you permanently. And the carpenter replied, there are many bridges that need to be built. Folks, we spend too much time building dams, damming up our emotions, damming up our thoughts, damming up our anger at someone else, we need to spend a whole lot more time building bridges. Find a solution that includes a bridge. If you want to get over something, the only way you're going to do it is by building a bridge and going over that bridge. I tell people all the time, treat it like a bridge, get over it. If there's not a bridge there, build one yourself. You can do it. The emotional bridges and, and stresses that keep us from other people aren't worth it. At some point, at some point, that person's going to leave this world. And when they do, don't be regretful. Don't be regretful because you did something you shouldn't. Don't be regretful because they did something they shouldn't. Is it really worth it? Is it? No. If they were good with God, they're going to come back. But if you're not good with God, I preached this the other day right in the memorial service. If you're not good with God, you're not going to be there for our reunion. Right. You've got to know that you're good. You've got to know that you got it down. And you've got it down if you're good with God. Amen? Amen? You want to see that loved one again. You want to say that last four or five words you forgot to say. 
You want to give them that thought that you had when you picked up a flower or walked by a store or saw a sign on the side of the road. You drove the route you drove 40 years ago. You went to the beach. You saw a house you once lived in. Don't you want to go back in your high mind? Don't you want to go back and be able to say, okay, this happened then. But when I die, we're going to discuss the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. <coughs> That's the rest of the story, folks. Get to the other side. You can only get to the other side if you build a bridge. What's the ultimate bridge, guys? What's the ultimate bridge? That's it right there. No matter how great the chasm between us, no matter how much our differences are, that bridge reaches every time. That's a cell connection you never lose. That's a commitment to you and to your life that he made when he hung on that cross and came back resurrected. He did it for you and for me and for you, 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 every one of them. He did it because he loved you. If you don't know God's love, if you don't know God's love, you need to get to know him. And it's very easy to do that. Very, very easy to do that. All you have to do is tell God, I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. And uh, I believe you died on that cross for me and was resurrected and you came back again. A little while we're going to do a communion. Please, if you do not have a personal relationship with God, do not participate. If you do have a personal relationship with God, feel free to and join us. If you're not really sure, Let's pray about it. Get you done. Enjoy it in. I mean, you can get to enjoy these wonderful little wafers. And... <laughs> it's a big snack, guys. Come on. If you're sitting out there and you don't know where you are with God, let's get you straight right now. Okay. You need that bridge. That bridge, any gap you have in your life. But once you have that fixed, then... You've got a responsibility to pass it on. So stop with the fighting with your relatives on the phone. Stop with the neighbor who starts a motorcycle at 2 o'clock in the morning. We all got one, right? That's who it is. You put those pipes on that. I wonder who it was. You must be, you must be pushing the motorcycle down my house and then starting it up. Seriously, folks. Nothing worth it. Nothing of this earth is worth it. Okay, no argument. No, I'm standing on principle. How are you going to feel when you're standing before God? I still have my principles, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord, I should have stood on yours. But then it's too late. Do it before it's too late. Like the man said, do it now. I'm glad you said that. I didn't have to. Do it now, right now. Now's the time. You know if you aren't good with God. You know it in your heart. You may deny it to everyone and even to yourself. But in that point, in the morning when you walk in and look in that mirror, you know when you look in that mirror first thing in the morning, you're not good with God. It's just like when you told the wife you did not eat that last declare. <laughs> you know you did. The dog must have got one of the dogs open the refrigerator now. Well, he's smart. You get that look. German Shepherd. That's right, it's a German Shepherd world, but yeah. never seen you open a refrigerator, yes. Uh, <laughs> Folks, this is something sweeter than any candy, sweeter than any honey, and you need it in your life. And if you don't have it, you have the opportunity to get it right now. Okay. Want the communion now? Yes, yeah, do it. Okay. We're about to do our communion, as I said, if you are a believer, if you are right with God, please feel free to join us. If you are not a believer, please don't participate because this is a very solemn remembrance. It is remembering what he did for us when he died on the cross. And in remembering that, you must be true to the fact that you must know God. You must have a relationship with him. So I'm about to pray for the implement. Shall we pray, please? Precious Heavenly Father, as we begin this remembrance today, we know that this small wafer that's in this container 
is a representation of your body. Your body was crushed and beaten and bruised. And we know that as we partake of that, we should do so with solemn reverence. Because, Father, we are recognizing the sacrifice that you made on the cross for us. We are recognizing that you were beaten, you were ridiculed. And, Father, this small, tiny remembrance, this tiny wafer and this little bit of juice, Father, represents not just your beaten and bruised body, but it represents the new covenant in your blood. The new covenant that says no matter what you've done, there need be no more sacrifices. You pay the ultimate sacrifice. And Father, so today, please bless these implements for our body, just as your precious word nourishes our souls, that we may, as we partake, get the real meaning of resurrection day. It's not Easter, folks. It's resurrection day. And Father, we recognize that right now. Let the church say amen. 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 The Bible tells us that on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he was happy to have a last supper with the, his disciples. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, For I have received from the Lord what I have passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes, Amen. until he returns. He's coming back for us, guys. Amen. He's coming back for every single one of us. And we want what he's got. He built that bridge back to us. We need to build that bridge to someone else. We need to share the good news with them. Amen? Amen. Oh, wow, I think he has home for us. I think so. We'll have a uh, trash can back by where you pick those up to put these in. We are... Sorry. <clears throat> sometimes it's noisy, sometimes it's not. We are a moment. He is forever. Yes. We have a song... And it's called Be Under Your Name. We are a moment. You are. us all right there. 
You're included. You're not excluded. The only problem is you got to stand up and say, I want to be included. I want to be a part of God's family. I want to go forth with him right now, and I leave that other life behind. And you can only leave it behind if you let go and let God and let it happen right now. Take God in your heart. If you're out there on YouTube land, you're watching this tomorrow, the next day, a year from now. If you're sitting in a boat fishing, if you're watching a football game, if you're watching a baseball game, if you're out watching soccer, it doesn't matter. Get on your knees and say, Lord, I confess in my mouth that I am a sinner. And I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and was resurrected and came back. And he came back for me. Say, Lord, take me now. Do it right now. Your life will never be the same. And then when you go forth from there and you have that peace and you have that joy, spread it, folks. Build bridges. Talk to those people you haven't talked to in 20 years. When you have an argument over $5, $20, $10, believe me, it's not going to be worth it in the end. When you sit back in your last moments and you reflect on the things in this life that you could have done, don't have regrets. Don't have regrets. Say, I reached out to that person with my heart. What they do from that point is up to them. But you know what? We got to do the reaching. Amen? Amen? We have to do the reaching and we have to do it, as the man said, right now. But uh, I, I want to close this with a word of prayer. So uh, enjoy your uh, resurrection day, as we're calling it now. And uh, we will see you again next week. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your son. We give you thanks for your plan. We know that we can never repay the pain that Jesus went through for the, for the cost that he paid for our salvation, Father. We can only honor you glorify you and give you as much thanks as we can we can serve you we can take your gospel out to the world and father we just pray that we are good servants for you father because that's what you ask for us you ask obedience from us but father we are glad to do that we know that you you care for us watch over us and provide for us so once again in jesus name we give you thanks so we uh we're going to be back next week. I hope you all come back and we will uh, we see you then. We have a trash can in the back and we have our, our offering plate back there so you can drop stuff in there. So thank you very much and we'll see you next week.